Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. A big budget surplus means there's extra money for priorities. This week, the Senate Education and Agriculture chairs highlight aspects of their respective budget proposals. Plus, a measure to bring federal dollars to the state is headed to the governor's desk. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. With a former teacher as governor, a DFL-controlled legislature, and a record budget surplus, Minnesota's schools and school children are expected to reap some big benefits. Joining me to talk about the Senate's proposed budget for E-12 education is a former educator and the current chair of the Senate Education Finance Committee, Senator Mary Kunish. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. The Senate proposes to increase the per-pupil funding formula by 4% for the 2024 school year, 5% for 2025. Significant increases. The House is approaching it a little bit differently. They have 4% in the first year, 2% the following year, but tying future increases to inflation. Mm -hmm. Why is the Senate taking this approach? Well, we did the numbers. We looked at what we could do right here in real time if we in, uh, included that um, index to inflation and found that it would decrease um, our budget by almost a third. And our intention is to get those dollars to the classrooms, to the students and the teachers as quickly as we can. And I'm not, we're not uh, um, saying we will never consider indexing to inflation. We just don't feel like this is the, the year to do it. Um, there's time for us to implement it and talk about it with the House and with the governor and come up with a really good plan. I have some concerns about future um, issues. Should we tie it um, as far as how it would affect the entire um, state budget if education is taking those in, in hard times? So um, I'm open to a future uh, decision, but I think this year is the year that we get those dollars into the schools so that they can put that in the classroom with the teachers. Chronically underfunded cross subsidies for special education and English language learners are reduced in the Senate's budget proposal. Uh, the target is 60% for special education, 75% for English language learners by the 2026 school year. Mm -hmm. There was talk at the beginning of session of completely eliminating one or both cross subsidies. So why take a slightly slower approach at this time? Well, again, so that we can use those dollars that we have right now um, to address some of the most immediate needs. But also we have to remember that the federal government has a responsibility to fund these, these programs, both our EL and our special education. And so we're leaving a little buffer there for the federal government to pick up their tab, but also recognizing that as time goes forward, we can adjust those, those amounts. And um, right now they all fit very well into our budget and so we'll do it as as we go into that incremental rather than one foul swoop. Uh, one effort in the bill that I think is probably quite near and dear to your heart is that funding would be provided to ensure that every school has a licensed media specialist or librarian mm -hmm. and that was your field. Why is this important? Well, I was a library media specialist for 20 of the 25 years that um, I taught in our public school system. And I know the contribution that our library media specialists do. It's not just checking books in and checking books out. We do all the a lot of the technology um, training. I did it for K through five. All their, their library skills, all their research skills, all their resource skills, all their technology skills, along with um, facilitating testing that goes on in our library system. So we're a very vital part of our, um, of our school uh, community, as well as providing um, those resources for teachers and professional development. Um, and when we're so concerned about literacy in this day and age, it's really important to have somebody that has the skill, has the um, excellence to be that, that literary um, leader in our schools and um, bring those back into our school system to make sure our kids are getting the best, um, the best resources that we can provide them with. Well, and speaking of literacy, the uh, statewide test scores showed that about half of Minnesota kids are not able to read at grade level. And so this bill includes the READ Act, which I believe, if I'm correct, would fund teacher training and curriculum and require that all Minnesota schools move to 
evidence-based instruction that does include phonics. Are these investments and changes then going to help those kids get back on track as readers? Well, we sure hope so. I, th I think it's the right approach to start moving in that direction, um, especially looking at those evidence-based programs that um, there's a, a wide variety of them and schools will be able to choose or districts will be able to choose which curriculum they want. But um, making sure that phonics is a, is a key part of that is going to be very, very important. And if we are all working on that goal together, um, I think we will be successful. The Senate budget proposes a $71 million investment to increase the number of teachers of color and American Indian teachers. There's also increases for bonuses for out-of-state teachers. Are you confident that enough is being done not only to ensure that Minnesota's future teaching workforce matches the culture and ethnicity of Minnesota's kids, but simply that there's just going to be enough teachers in the classroom? Well, the uh, increased teachers of color and indigenous is a very comprehensive um, package of bills. It starts with recruitment and it goes all the way to supporting the uh, students or potential teachers in the classroom as well as in the university through their student teaching and then providing mentorship and encouragement um, as we go forward. So am I confident? I I'm pretty confident that this is an excellent approach to it, um, and we're hoping, and we've seen that with the bits and pieces we've been able to put in place, there's already more of those teachers of color and indigenous in the pipeline, and we're hoping that this will encourage it, and, and when they see more teachers of color going through, they feel like they've got a place in the, in the system as well. And so investing in this, is, I think, is just a win-win for all of our schools and all of our teachers and our students. Uh, in December, the Minnesota Department of Health released the results of the 2022 Minnesota Student Survey, which showed that students are struggling with depression and anxiety at higher rates than at any other time in the 35 years that this study has been done. $49 million is being set aside in the Senate budget for student support personnel. Is it enough? Mm. It's Probably not enough, but it's the best we could do right now. Uh, we came into this session, and when I say we, I, I mean um, uh, Senator Swadzinski, who is the chair of education policy, who he himself had over 30 years of, of teaching. Uh, and so between us, we wanted to really focus on the nucleus of the student. And so one of the first hearings I had was around student voices. And we had over 30 kids come in and talk to us about how they're feeling, what's going on, what's working, what's not working. And that's really what we based our whole legislation around, the voices of the students. Mental health is absolutely one of the top priorities. And uh, recognizing that there are very, uh, some schools have little or no resources that are going to help with those issues, we wanted to make sure we took a chunk of those, those dollars and put it towards that. Um, it's a, it's a you know, surround around for the students and the teachers because if those students are struggling, that means the teachers are going to be struggling as well. So we'll keep working on it. Again, this is our first year. We, you know, I'm taking the long call approach and looking at how we're going to build on every year those resources that are going to make a difference in the wraparound services for our students. And one final question. This bill provides funding so that hourly employees like bus drivers, cafeteria workers, teachers' aides, and paraprofessionals would be eligible for unemployment benefits during the summer months. Uh, why is it time for these workers to be included in the unemployment insurance pool? These workers are what makes our schools work. You know, I think of it as a wheel and all of those uh, different um, positions are the spokes and that's what makes, you know, centers on the kids and makes our school go around. Um, when they are, are let go during the summer and now have to go find other employment, uh, find other ways to resource themselves, um, it's a hardship. And many of them don't come back to the classroom, don't come back to the schools because they found something else that's a little less stressful perhaps or pays more. So in so many ways, this is also a retention plan. And it's also recognizing the value of them as an employee and the, the supports that they put in, in our schools. They're there with the kids just as much as any teacher, and oftentimes in some of the least desirable situations. I really feel like we need to um, support them as well and show our appreciation. Senator Mary Kunish, thank you so much. My pleasure.
A bill designed to help Minnesota capture federal dollars for energy infrastructure development and clean energy projects was approved by the Senate. The federal infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, those are things done in Washington, D.C. to help each and every state. House File 1656 provides the state competitive matching funds so that Minnesota can compete for those funds, compete with the other states, bring infrastructure to our clean energy system, and bring jobs to each of our communities. Just a few of the programs available in the IRA and the IIJA for which this fund will provide matching dollars. Carbon capture for large-scale projects. That by itself, members, is $937 million available to states like ours. For my friend Senator Grunhagen, rural and municipal utility advanced cybersecurity grants, over $250 million, Senator, to help protect rural co-ops and municipal from cyber attack. The basics, members, the public likes it when we do the basics. Transmission Facilitation Program, that's help moving electricity, $2.5 billion available to Minnesotans. And finally, for those worried about reliability, $5 billion available for the federal preventing outages and enhancing resilience grants. These are just some, Mr. President, of what's available if Minnesota can compete. Solar viability does not work, and we're spending millions of dollars driving up the cost of electricity, undermining our base load electricity on a boondoggle that has to be cleaned up one day. Members, I appreciate the $250 million for the cybersecurity in here, but members, we're going the wrong direction in so much of this area. The state gets to position themselves to be the top priority for getting this money, and then big organizations that have uh, their plans and their grants ready to go will be first at the trough on this first-come, first-served basis, and there will be nothing left for the little guy that might see this and think they've got a project that could help uh, their small community uh, in a concrete manner. One of the main concerns I have with this bill is the accountability. Right now, as written, this is a first-come, first-served basis. And we've seen the history here in Minnesota with a lot of the federal money that's come in and been handed out. And later we find out that it went to groups that were just not being that responsible with the money and in some cases flat-out fraudulent. And this bill, as written, has no accountability to make sure that that does not happen once again. Mr. President, I signed on as a co-author of this bill because I believe in the concept. Because there are a lot of things that we could use that federal money to improve the infrastructure here in Minnesota. Unfortunately, the details of this bill fail to provide and distribute those funds properly, in my opinion. The things we're going to do with this money are good for every community. They're good for every utility. Generation, carbon capture, transmission, distribution, resiliency, efficiency. When your district gets these grants, I would like you to be able to say, that's good news. I'm glad I voted for that appropriation. As far as the way we administer it, this is the same format and used in these states. And I might just add what you already know, the states I listed who've already passed this all run by Republican legislatures, all with basically the same language and all with the same appropriation scheme, which is a competitiveness fund. The Senate's proposed agriculture funding bill achieved bipartisan approval during its final committee hearing and will be debated by the full Senate this week. Senator Eric Putnam is the chair of the Senate Agriculture, Broadband and Rural Development Committee, and he joins me to highlight some of the investments in the Senate's proposal. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Shannon. It's great to get a chance to visit. You are a communications professor by trade. This is your second term in the Senate, and it's your first term on the Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development Committee, and you are the chair. So what drew you to this committee, to the role of the chair, and how big has the learning curve been? There's lots to learn, and there's lots to love about Minnesota agriculture. It's fascinating stuff, and I'm a curious guy, so I've 
dove in headfirst on this and I've been talking to people, been reading, I've been studying about this as much as I possibly can. And the more that you look into Minnesota agriculture, the more simply amazing it is. Uh, the uh, incredible resilience and creativity of Minnesota's farmers. It is so uh, incredibly impressive and inspiring. Uh, and in the work I've done so far, I've gotten to learn so much from all these people who do these jobs. And it's, uh, it's a great opportunity. And uh, I hope that I'm up to it. Uh, so in a statement, you said that you have traveled the state and that you, quote, heard the voice of the farmer. What did you hear from farmers and what are some of their struggles and how will this budget help them? And that's a great question. So, yeah, we've, we've had uh, discussions, we've had town halls, we've had listening sessions. Uh, and I have probably visited with close to 400 farmers over the past two months. And their concerns are like the concerns of other Minnesotans. They're just a little bit more particular or more specific or more precise. So farmers these days will tell you most likely that they're concerned about stability. It's a volatile industry in the first place. And they're concerned about you know, having some security for their investments and their work and making sure that they're compensated for the hard work that we do. You see how that's a problem that most Minnesotans feel. But farmers feel it acutely given how volatile and dynamic their industry is. So that's one of the big things you're going to hear. You're also going to hear concern about the future of farming, whether that's in innovation and becoming more sustainable, or if it's getting new people to farm. Both of those things are things that farmers are thinking about right now. Uh, and they, they care tremendously about those issues. And that's why we constructed the bill we did. Uh, this bill doesn't just hear the voice of the farmer. It's because of the voice of the farmer. And this is a special year because there is a fairly large budget surplus and each budget area gets some of that budget surplus to be used for one time spending. Fourteen million dollars has been allocated for a grain indemnity fund. What is this and how will it help farmers? Yeah, you know, in the conversations I've been having with farmers, this is one of the things that comes up all the time. And it's exactly about this issue of stability and security. So uh, I'm a grain farmer. I got a lot of grain. I, I got to store it somewhere to dry out and give it some time. Uh, what happens if that elevator fails? What happens if it goes down? What happens if the company that's running the place goes bankrupt? That happens almost once a year in the state of Minnesota. And every time it does, I mean, a family goes bankrupt. They're, the current bond system pays 11 cents on the dollar. If you have $400,000 worth of grain, your entire year's yield, and that's all gone, and that's the only compensation you get, that's not okay. Uh, so we are joining all the states around us that already have grant indemnity funds. Minnesota is the worst at providing security around grain in the entire upper Northwest West. And after we pass this bill, we will become the best. So an issue of security for farmers. Now, you mentioned how exciting and innovative farming might be in the future. And one thing that jumped out at me, uh, I was intrigued by a section that details grants that are available to organizations interested in developing quote, continuous living, cover crops, and cropping systems. The bill mentions a grain called Kernza. It's a perennial grain, which I learned is a domesticated form of wheat grass. It's one possible new development in agriculture. Uh, the Washington Post wrote about it in 2021 and called it a recipe for fighting climate change and feeding the world. So is this the kind of example of the future of agriculture that we might be talking about? This is so incredibly cool. This is the coolest thing in the world. We actually got to tour the Forever Green uh, space, their laboratories and their, their greenhouses uh, just last week. And what they are doing is absolutely amazing. They are uh, finding ways to grow certain crops over the winter periods to, to, to have uh, crops like Kernza. If you look at a Kernza plant, I don't know if you got a chance to take a look at it, but you know, the top of it looks like another normal sort of wheat uh, uh, kind of situation. But the roots are like 10, 15 feet long, and they're huge. It stops erosion. It sequesters carbon. Um, and, and I want to make sure that I'm clear on this, that Minnesota's farmers are ready to lead. When it comes to innovation and sustainability, they don't see any kind of conflict between the kinds of sustainable practices that they want to do that they know aren't just good for the earth, they're not just good for the soil, they're not just good for the quality of water, they're good for their businesses, they'll increase their yield, they'll uh, have brand new uh, seasons of planting and new crops to, to harvest. Uh, this is the future of Minnesota agriculture, but it, as it's the future of Minnesota agriculture, it's going to become the future of world agriculture because the things we're doing here are brilliant uh, and their uh, uh, opportunities are endless. There's also, um, it's not a new program, but it's getting a boost in funding, and that's for soil health. Uh, how will grants for making 
soil more resilient impact the future of farming? Oh, it's great. I mean, it's, it, farmers, as I mentioned earlier, they want to try new things. Uh, they want to uh, do what they can for soil health and for water health because they know it's in their best interest as a business, but also as a human being, as someone who lives on the farm where they're producing the product that they're producing. Uh, so oh, basically soil health grants will um, enable farmers to buy kind of more expensive equipment that lets them do things differently on their farm. Uh, and that new equipment will have long-term benefits both for the environment and for their businesses as their yields improve. Uh, much has been written about the future of farming, and you re referenced this earlier. Uh, the average age of a farmer in the United States, according to the Department of Ag the U.S. Department of Agriculture, is about 60 years old. So I know there's funding in here to bring new people into farm the farming industry. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredibly important. Um, and some of the things that we've done is we, we've been working on the beginning farmer tax credit, which is a tax credit that a farmer gets when they lease or sell their land to a new farmer. In the past, there's been a restriction on that so that it can't go to a family member. But family need, members need help now. Farming is incredibly capital intensive, now more than ever. The, the value of land is out of control right now. I was talking to a farmer a couple weeks ago from Avon, and he told me that he bought his land for $600 an acre, and now it's $6,000 an acre. Uh, there was a parcel of land, my pal Senator Weber told me, a parcel of land in his district that sold recently for $19,000 an acre. It's impossible to become a new farmer, and we wonder why our farms are consolidating and small farms are disappearing. It's because we're not supporting new young people who need to go in to farming. And so that's something that's been very important for me, and I'm really proud of how we're helping people do that in this agriculture omnibus bill. And finally, there's also $100 million that will expand broadband access throughout the state. This has been an ongoing topic of conversation. Uh, Department of Ag Commissioner Tom Peterson has been on this program several times uh, talking about, from his own firsthand experience, the importance of broadband for successful farming operations. How far does this $100 million go? I'm going to be honest with you, it's not as far as I'd like it to go. Uh, there are 291,000 households in the state of Minnesota right now without reliable quality broadband. That is completely unacceptable. If we had 291,000, if we had 10 houses that didn't have water or electricity, we would do something to actually fix the problem. We're doing that now as best we can. And so you'll see in the bill, there's $30 million for border-to-border -border broadband, and then there's another $20 million for what's called the Low Density Project. And that's a new initiative that's being done by DEED's Office of Broadband. And it's going to focus on those places that are hard to get to. Uh, those areas because they're more expensive. It's really expensive to bring fiber out to one house on the end of a street, but that one house matters too. It's got Minnesotans in it, and we care about them. So we're going to find a way to get them fiber. Senator Eric Putnam, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords visited Minnesota recently to advocate for stronger gun safety measures. Our lives can change so quickly. Mine did when I was shot. But I never gave up hope. I chose to make a new start. To move ahead, to not look back. I'm relearning so many things, how to walk, how to talk and I'm fighting to make the country safer. Yay. It can be so difficult. Losses hurt, sets back are hard, but I tell myself, move ahead. I'm finding joy in small things, riding my bike, playing the French horn, going to the gym, laughing with friends the small things add up we are living challenging time but we are up for the challenge my own recover has taken years many many people have helped me along the way and i learned so much i learned when people care for each other and work together progress is possible the world is possible but change doesn't happen over in it. And we can't do it alone. Join me. Let's move ahead together. Thank you. As a teacher, a father, as governor, as a member of Congress, as a member of society, I refuse to believe this country is not good enough to do what other countries have done. 
simultaneously protected their children while protecting their freedoms and the lawful right to have gun ownership. This idea that, that there is supremacy around your right to have and carry and wield or whatever at any given part of the day has never been part of what this country is. I, as a lawful gun owner, someone who's done this my whole life, recognize that what we're proposing, whether it is making sure that there is a significant background checks that make sure we close some of these loopholes, or red flag legislation that all of us should want for our own relatives, knowing that a lot of these gun deaths are suicides in opportunities, and in even in the cases we hear early in men of these shootings, family members who knew and have a lawful court-ordered right that doesn't strip people of their rights, but recognizes that if someone is in a situation where they are a danger to themselves or others, we have a responsibility to help them. Uh, we, the association, uh, with many Minnesota support background checks, legislation, and extreme risk protection order legislation. Current law here in Minnesota has a loophole that allows handgun and semi-automatic military assault rifle sales at gun shows, private transactions, and online purchases to happen without a background check. While all other sales do require background checks, we strongly feel that requiring a background check on all sales and transfers will prevent at least some firearms from going to individuals who are not legally allowed to possess them. While we know this won't prevent all gun violence or gun deaths, we do think it will make a difference. We have met with law enforcement officials from Florida, Illinois, Connecticut, and Virginia. We have found that extreme risk protection orders work. We've heard the examples. And the chair of the Senate Jobs and Economic Development Committee highlighted several aspects of the omnibus jobs bill. This bill is about job creation, growing our economy, and supporting both businesses and workers. And so, those, so the folks that you see behind me represents a cross-section of what this bill is really all about. All of Minnesota, whether that's women, BIPOC communities, Minnesotans, um, uh, veterans, people with disabilities, folks from the cities and all across greater Minnesota stand to benefit from this bill. I, I'm also particularly excited because it allows us to remain globally competitive. Chip manufacturing, chip equipment manufacturing and design and in uh, other suppliers. This means thousands of high paying <coughs> high-tech manufacturing jobs that will sustain, that have family sustaining wages. The investment of $100 million of state fund in this committee's bill will be matched by $100 million in federal funding to create bio-industrial manufacturing campus and pilot scale that is unmatched in the country and it's going to be right here in Minnesota. It's good for Minnesota's farmers and rural communities. It will create quality jobs for the state's diverse workforce in urban, suburban, and exurban communities. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.